So far, we've learned how to find properties of water and other substances using the tabulated values that are found in property tables, like compressed liquids, saturated liquid vapor with temperature or pressure, and superheated vapor. We established that if we know two independent properties, we can find all the other properties we care about using these tables. And we've gone over how these tables exist for other substances, like refrigerants, ammonia, and propane. Equations of state are those equations that allow us to find some of the properties without going through pages of tabulated values, interpolating or extrapolating to find a certain value that describes our state. In general, any equation that relates the pressure, specific volume and temperature is an equation of state. The most common equation of state is the ideal gas equation. And so where does this ideal gas equation come from? Well, it turns out that this equation is the result of empirical relationships between pressure, specific volume, and temperature. Boyle's law states that the pressure is inversely proportional to specific volume. You increase the pressure, you make the density go up, or what is the same, make the specific volume go down. Makes sense. This means that PV is a constant. The Gay-Lussac law, or pressure law, states that the pressure is directly proportional to temperature. More pressure, more energy for molecules to shake, meaning more temperature. This means that P over T is a constant. And finally, Charles' law states that the specific volume is directly proportional to the temperature. More temperature, more energy for molecules to shake, making it a larger volume, decrease in density, or increase in specific volume. V over T is a constant. If we multiply all three, we get PV over T squared, and on the right-hand side, a new constant. If we take the square root of both sides, PV over T is a constant. When physicists started plotting, for example, PV bar over T against P, V bar being the molar specific volume, they noticed that for constant temperatures, the plots would look like straight lines, T1, T2, T3, etc. And they all converged for really low pressure values. So if we take the limit of PV over T when P approaches zero, we find that that constant all curves converge to is what we define as the universal gas constant R bar. Notice that we're using the molar specific volume V bar, not just V, and therefore the value for R is R bar in joules per mole Kelvin or kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin. That's per mole, not per kilogram. Since molar specific volume is the volume divided by number of moles, as opposed to the volume divided by mass, like specific volume is, we can write this ideal gas equation as PV equal to nRT. This is probably the version of the equation you are most familiar with from high school chemistry or physics classes. Now remember that these temperatures must be in Kelvin, not degrees Celsius, as Kelvin is the absolute temperature. And since the molecular mass m can be written as the total mass of a substance divided by the number of moles, we could multiply the specific volume times m to get the molar specific volume. We can therefore substitute v bar by v times m to get pvm equals r bar t, which can be rearranged as pv equal to r bar over m times t, which is helpful because we can define r, the gas's constant, as r bar over m. This is specific to the gas, it's not the universal gas constant. Its units are kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. If you know the gas constant for your gas, then you'll most likely use this last equation. But if you don't have it, you can always use the universal R bar and look up the molecular mass of your gas, which is basically the atomic weight of all the atoms that make up your gas. For example, carbon dioxide would be two atoms of oxygen at 15.999 daltons each, plus one atom of carbon at 12.011 daltons, or 44.01 daltons per molecule, or what is the same, grams per mole. This ideal gas equation is also useful to solve for properties from state 1 or state 2, if we know enough information about either state. Of course, this is only applicable to actual ideal gases. Not all substances are ideal gases. Is water an ideal gas? Do you think we can use this, for example, for superheated water? Well, sometimes we can, sometimes we cannot. There's actually a TV diagram that illustrates this pretty clearly. If the state you're considering is found in the ideal gas region shown here, of course we can use the ideal gas equation. 
and it even tells us how much the percentage error is close to depending on the location of our system state. If our state is not located within that highlighted region, then you should use the superheated tables, as easy as that. Other gases like argon, oxygen, helium, nitrogen, air, we can definitely use the ideal gas equation with little errors, unless very low specific volumes or extremely high pressure values. Compressibility charts can tell us how much we deviate from the ideal gas equation. In general, you can just say that the equation of state is Z equal to PV over RT, and for ideal gases, Z is 1. For non-ideal gases, Z will have a value different than 1, and you can look up that value using the aforementioned compressibility chart. If you're interested in how you can use the Z values to correct for non-ideality, in the case of a non-ideal gas that is, you can check a link in the description of this video, but we won't be using this much for thermo systems, since we can usually find the properties we're looking for with other resources, such as the tables we've been using. However, here's a quick overview of how you can make use of the compressibility factors so that you can use the ideal gas equation. Remember what we called the highest point of the dome in a TV diagram and what it meant? We said that that peak was called the critical point and that anything above it would be a supercritical fluid. We didn't say much more beyond that, but the values for both temperature and pressure at the critical point is what we call the critical temperature and the critical pressure. Reduced pressure is defined as the current pressure divided by critical pressure. Reduced temperature is defined as the current temperature divided by the critical temperature. And finally, reduced volume is equal to the current specific volume over R times critical T over critical P. It can be either V over R or V bar over R bar. The values for the critical pressure and the critical temperature are found in a thermodynamics table, either your textbook or just look it up online. To find the compressibility factor, you first calculate the reduced pressure and reduced temperature and you go into the compressibility chart. Your x-axis will be the reduced pressure values and the different curves will be the different reduced temperature values. A quick example here, if you have found a reduced pressure of 2 and a reduced temperature of 1.3, you'd have a compressibility factor Z equal to 0.7. This one is really straightforward to use, but it is only helpful if you have pressure and temperature. What if you don't have those two? What if one of the properties you have is the specific volume instead? In that case, you go to another chart where the x-axis is still reduced pressure, but the lines for specific volume are also present. If you have P, R, and V, you use the x-axis and the line that corresponds to your reduced volume. If you have T, R, and V, you use the T, R lines and the reduced volume lines. And important to note here is that there is really two of these charts. One for low pressures and one for intermediate pressures. Let's use a very short example that makes use of the state equation and compressibility charts, and if you want to check out longer, more complex examples on this topic, make sure to check out the links found in the description of this video. Let's say we have water vapor at 9 megapascals and 425 degrees Celsius, and we want to find the specific volume. We know that the molecular mass of water is 18.015 kilograms per kilomole, that the critical temperature is 647.1 Kelvin, and that the critical pressure is 22.06 megapascals. We'll find this specific volume using tables, the ideal gas equation only, and the compressibility factor Z. If we're using tables, we go to our superheated tables. It makes sense that if we're talking about gases, water needs to be a vapor, right? You can follow the usual process of going to a saturated table first, to see that at that pressure and temperature, you'd be in a superheated state, but here it's pretty obvious. Here, for a temperature of 425 C and a pressure of 9 megapascals, we'd have to interpolate between 400 and 450. Of course, since how we interpolate is linearly, the specific volume would be exactly the midpoint of these two values, at 0.031742 cubic meters per kilogram. If we're using the ideal gas equation, with no correction factors, V is R bar over molar mass times T over P. We plug in all the values that we were given, making sure units are correct, 
and we find that V is 0 0.035027. Not great. And finally, if we calculate the reduced pressure and the reduced temperature, we can go to our Z chart and use the PR value and the TR value to say that Z is roughly 0 0.88. This results in a specific volume of 0 0.030824, which is not quite the value from the tables, but at least much closer than without using the compressibility factor Z. We used PR and TR here because those were the two properties that we had. The other charts I mentioned and showed before are used if we have the specific volume. If you want to see how those are used, make sure to check out the links to the other examples in the description below. You'll find the other lectures of the thermodynamics course and other engineering courses there too. Thanks for watching.